So right now we're with Yves Lejawang, uh, which is the Chief Content Officer in Focus Entertainment. Uh, you've been 11 years into Ubisoft, uh, working in Ubisoft, and you got mo 25 years of experience into the, okay. the industry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, I started, uh, I'm old, <laughs> I started 25 years ago. Uh, initially in the, at the very urge of internet when there was uh, the very first online game which were very uh, very ugly at the time and then switched to MMORPG and online games, Codemasters, Scriptic, Nevrax and then joined Ubisoft for a bit more than 11 years and then Focus since uh, close to two years now. Uh, we're gonna start talking uh, about Focus uh, to break a bit into the ice. Tell me what's your favorite game of the of Focus Entertainment? Oh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> it, it can uh, be a saga also. It can be a saga. I would say the favorite game is favorite games are the one not released yet. Which one? Sorry. The one not released yet. Oh, okay, oh, okay, oh, okay. That's that's a good answer actually. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Uh, what are you currently working on? What are your current projects? Uh, sorry? The, the current projects that you're working on. Um, so my, my job, my responsibility is to find a new project and game for oh. the future. So I'm traveling a lot yeah. uh, in great places like, like here in Bilbao uh, to find new games, new teams, new projects for uh, publishing or eventually acquisition or find relevant ways to collaborate together. Uh, so many projects, uh, some will go up to publishing, some will go up to acquisitions, some other publishers will, 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 uh, will sign the game first before us. So a lot of things unannounced. I'm working on lots of unannounced things. I guess that you can uh, talk about it with us. Unfortunately ah. not. I can just tell you that uh, you, you should uh, tune on the Game Awards in December. Yeah, yeah, basically. We're going to talk about that also after this. Uh, on what, are your, what is your perspective about that? I mean, uh, we're right now on the big conference, and what have you seen that may have caught your eye? Uh, first, it's, it's uh, like the, the, the industry here and in Spain in general and in the Basque country uh, has always been very active. Uh, with new generation and you see like both from Tequila Works, the Construct team, uh, Numentian for every generation, uh, the Game Kitchen etc. So it's very active industry uh, here in Spain with already a lot of successes. So getting in touch with these developers and studios and finding the new ones with the students out from school that might set up their studio. Uh, it's uh, of course finding new games and teams but also not losing touch with the industry and um, yeah, foreseeing the future of uh, with the young talents and the new new games. Uh, what will this industry? What will the the games become in the in the next years? Well, uh, you've mentioned the the Game Awards, in which a Black Star Requiem has received a uh, a bunch of of nominations, five, five nominations yeah. in different categories. Are you seeing forward to them? Oh yes, of course. Uh, the the first thing is we're not making games together with Azobo Studio, we're not making games to awards, it's really great to get awards, but we're making games for the players first. So the, the, the really first award that's kin to our heart is the player reception, and that's the best award in the world. But getting awards from the Game Awards uh, is always cool, it's really great, and also for us and for Azobo, um, we're not a like, big company with thousands and thousands of developers uh, it's not like an incredible huge budget especially compared to some others uh, that are non nominated so also um, it's the proof that we can make good games in good working conditions with Azobo and Focus employees uh, with not a huge incredible budget uh, and get aligned and nominated with all the big guys so that's really cool Tell us about the video games that uh, you have published uh, as, as Focus Entertainment because I've seen Warhammer, I've seen Alien, I've seen a Plague Tale Requiem. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah. So Focus, Focus DNA is a mix of first knowing how to take care of existing IPs. Uh, so Focus has worked with Warhammer, like you were saying, uh, Alien, uh, etc. So that's one part of Focus history of um, people know that if they want uh, big IPs from the movie, from comic books, etc., uh, they can come to us and we're going to take great care and, and make great games with them. Uh, second is um, growing together with the studios. That's been part of Focus DNA with 
studios like uh, spiders, cyanide, giants with farming simulator, was drawn from uh, an incredible, uh, unique game to multi-million uh, sellers now. Uh, and that's what we are trying to do with Azobo, uh, with Don't Nod, with uh, other studios uh, uh, we're work currently working with, with uh, The Parasite on Blacktail. Uh, so that's really part of our DNA growing together, finding small studio or uh, studio in transition to making, becoming uh, uh, larger and uh, accompanying them with our expertise and publishing support to, uh, to grow together. So that's, that's like your, your idea to take small studios and to help them grow as focus entertainment. Yeah, and, and they will help us grow as well. Yeah, that's that's like a symbiosis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna talk right now uh, about Ubisoft um, and the time that you spend there. Because uh, tell me, uh, which were the projects that you developed or you had to develop while you were in in Ubisoft? Because eleven years are not <laughs> <laughs> like like small time. It's not a small time. So Ubisoft, I I did one, two, th four different jobs. Yeah. Uh, within these 11 years. So first, before joining Ubisoft, I was 15 years in MMORPG. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Ubisoft hired me to, to help transition uh, from single player, retail oriented uh, offline games to help transition Ubisoft towards online uh, yeah. and player driven, etc. So first I started uh, coming from the MMO, hardcore MMO, etc. I started on Imagine, uh, which is a, like a, a brand, uh, Wii U, uh, Wii game uh, brand for, for twins generally. And we were making an MMO there, but more as a R&D project uh, to see in terms of hosting, anti-cheat, monetization, how to build up a fair monetization, um, taking care of the community, all the things that you need to, as a company, to grow in, yeah. to do multiplayer and online and uh, games. Uh, and then I moved to overseeing the uh, free-to-play portfolio at the time when we were doing uh, web-based and free-to-play games like uh, Anno Online, Settlers Online, Mighty Quest for Epic Loot. Uh, a lot of these games where we exp Ubisoft expanded even more the, the online expertise. And then we created a strike team uh, called Game as a Service Team that were pushing even, even further the online and uh, expertise. So our first babies were uh, the crew, uh, the, crew. the crew, Rainbow Six Siege, The Division, uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands, um, Steep, uh, so yeah, and, and Assassin's big Creed titles, obviously. Actually. Yeah. Big titles, big, big titles. So that was uh, like your moment in which you switched and you turned from thinking as, uh, let's say, indie developer, to call it somewhere, uh, to thinking as, as an enterprise and to decide, okay, this is what we need to do for the players and, and that was yeah. the, the change basically. The thing is, uh, the, um, what I've done at Ubisoft and what we're doing right now uh, at Focus is always uh, being player-centric, meaning again, like, like for the awards, uh, the, the very first thing we, the first audience for us is the players. So while designing games, producing games, publishing games, that's always the first thing we're trying to see, okay, where, what the players want now, um, what can surprise them, what can make them uh, cry, shiver, laugh, etc. So we're trying to, to find great unique gems and games to, to foster that level of emotions because video games, it's thinking, it's emotion, uh, it's a lot of different things and the focus for the players first. And uh, from the, the projects that you've uh, talked about in, in Ubisoft, which, one, which was the one that taught you the most uh, and that nowadays you look back and you say, oh, so nowadays I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't learn from this project? Uh, Rainbow Six Siege. Rainbow Six Siege, why? Because um, the, it was a rough start, the very first months of Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, and I think uh, with the Rainbow Six Teach uh, team in Montreal, with uh, Ubisoft, uh, it proved to the players and the industry that you can have a rough start as a game, uh, with bad reviews at the start, etc. And while working and listening to the players, changing uh, and, and being welcomed and appreciated by your players. And that was uh, really hard work, a lot of, a lot of work at the time. But in the end, the, the reward was um, switching from a 
not appreciated game at the first to uh, more than 80 million players enjoying it now. So it's yeah quite an achievement and uh, of course I wasn't alone but I was very um, implicated into uh, helping that so uh, yeah. That, that, that was a good experience that, actually yeah. at, the, at the end. You actually remind me of, of No Man's Sky because it was that game yeah. that, that started and started in a bad way, bad reviews, exactly. people saying that it couldn't be played and, and etc. Yeah. And nowadays the people have uh, stopped in a, in a great way uh, playing it but the people who have returned to the game or who have started to play the yeah. game now are actually saying that it's an, an absolute yeah. uh, amazing game. Yeah, and especially again, it's uh, initially the, the the team from No Man's Sky was a small team, indie game developers, mm -hmm. and that's why it's very important for publishers, triple A company, double A companies, to always listen, of course, to the players, but al always be uh, aware of what's happening in the indie game scene because we have a lot to learn from the indie game developers, and we have a lot to bring as publishers. So that's really the, like the marriage from the the best sides, uh, but always a lesson to learn and No Man's Sky was a great lesson for everyone in the industry. Apart from what you told us that you have to listen to the players and all, what was that thing that you learned from the time that you were in Ubisoft that you would uh, use as an, uh, as an advice to tell new developers how to develop their games? Ooh, I, I think there's no recipe. Uh, there is no one thing that will enlighten everyone and say, oh, that's how you should do. Uh, but the, the, the main pillars would be keep your vision, uh, meaning not like change your vision based on one Steam review, one press article, someone you meet and tells you, etc. So keep being creative and keep your vision uh, while listening to the player. And that's a balance to, to find because you don't need to listen to everything the player is saying because uh, there's uh, numerous uh, reviewers and, and reviewers. People, yeah. And, and some reviews are uh, quickly done, some are more uh, detailed, etc. So you need both to keep your vision while listening to the players uh, and listening to the industry also, because the industry is pretty um, uh, benevolent and, 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 and friendly uh, to each other, even between publishers, between developers. Uh, everyone wants the other to succeed. So you could tell the people to like listen to the to the players and to the developers, but be Keep critic with what they say. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why don't we talk about and, and also yeah. one very important thing? Um, always, always learn. Meaning, it's not because you have one year, five years, ten years, twenty-five years in the industry that okay, I know everything. I can relax and sit back. Uh, that's why coming to events like uh, Big in Bilbao reading articles, uh, hearing podcasts, uh, checking GDC videos or videos about what's new in the industry is always important because you, you won't be outdated and you will still be in touch with, uh, especially since development timeline can be very long, two years, three years, sometimes seven, eight years. Um, you need to constantly be aware of what's being done in the industry be because your game can be or your project can be old even before its releases hmm. so like the video game industry I, I agree with you totally that the video games industry is an industry that is constantly changing yes and at a speed that is in a manager mode so uh yeah basically you, you got to stay to stay updated yeah. uh if we talk about precisely the talk that you're gonna be giving tomorrow with christopher uh julia and johan yeah uh, what is your vision regarding the last year? Because in the last year, many companies have been bought, you, you may have seen it, uh, by enormous enterprises. We've got Activision Blizzard and uh, like the... the oh. The um, Embracer yeah. uh, and yeah, Tencent. Yeah, Embracer and, and, yeah. and all those stuff. Microsoft buying a lot, of, yeah. a lot of companies. What is your vision regarding that? Uh, I think first, all the acquisitions aren't equivalent in terms of strategy. They're not... Uh, done for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. One is done by strategic partner from the industry like Microsoft or Tencent or NetEase. Some are being done more on acquiring IPs. Mm -hmm. uh, some are being done through switching from a local market in China and moving to the West. Uh, so all these acquisitions, even if it seems to be piling up, they have different reasons behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, the very good thing about that is that sometimes it helps studios to um, 
uh, to grow and to to expand successful studios like uh, I won't give them like let's say Shiro in France who made North Guard etc. Have been acquired by a uh, none of these uh, famous names but someone else yeah. um, and yeah they've been successful for over 10 years now and uh, everyone is looking forward to with new means new financial means uh, what they can achieve next and so that's the positive thing the, the concerns we might have is about concentration uh, because uh, especially I'm an RPG fan, yeah. so uh, I love Obsidian, I love In Exile uh, companies and uh, having them uh, and Bethesda etc. and having them all within the same group, yeah. uh, will they still be different RPG companies in the next years? I hope so. Yeah, so the and Pentiment by Obsidian is uh, also, yeah, yeah, is yeah. very different, so it's not what you could expect from being part of a big group, so yeah. congrats to them. So you're, you're afraid that the, the big enterprises like Microsoft might buy what they want and adapt it as they want and that those companies may no longer have their ideals and have their vision. Microsoft is, is different because they, they, they have a, a platform, they have a business model, etc. So they're already part of the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so they know the industry, etc. So I wouldn't say Microsoft is, an, is not risk, but at least they know the industry is a really strong partner there. Yeah. Uh, no, it's more about concentration. Uh, how much concentration can be? Is there a cap? The yeah. So, yeah. 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 Basically. And uh, do you think that this may end up being, as to name it some way, the console war? Basically, because you know that in in the console industry, like there's the three big people, let's say, which is Nintendo, uh, Sony, and and Microsoft, and uh, uh, being the video game industry, the PC video game industry, being so divided with all those industries and the indie industry and the indie companies also, etc. You might that if they all pile up into one single uh, enterprise, that might be bad for the industry. Well, the console war. Every generation, there's a winner per the community yeah. size uh, and it's not always the same so one generation it's let's say Sony one generation afterwards it's Microsoft etc but each brings something new on the table mm -hmm. Sony brought a lot of uh, incredible uh, uh, exclusive IPs that now are expanding and can be expanding to PC yeah. or to transmedia or TV series thanks to what Sony had brought them initially like uh, uh, the, the last game of pass us, and everything yeah. from Microsoft. And, and Microsoft is doing the same as a Game Pass with allowing games like uh, Stray, for example, uh, like small indie game, but mm -hmm. incredible uh, game with a unique rendering for, for, for cats. Um, so there's no like absolute bad boy, etc. Yeah. Everyone is bringing both concerns, but also innovation. Mm -hmm. The one thing that very often in the last 25 years, innovation came from PC first. Because it's easier, you, 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 every developer, and especially now with Steam, every developer can, can put a game on Steam, which is another concern, because in the end, uh, it, it impacts the visibility that developers can get, because students can put, and they have the right to, and it's cool for them, can put their game there, like in two minutes on Steam, mm -hmm. just to test, to see how it goes, but it will add another number of, of games on Steam. Uh, there are uh, visual novels, there are uh, technology products, there are small TV series, there are a lot of things on Steam. So fighting the, for the ability f visibility for players is, can be pretty hard for uh, developers there. Yeah. But PC brought a lot, a uh, business model, uh, fr free to play, uh, fair monetization, uh, subscription. A uh, lot of things came from PC originally and have been taken care of and, and uh, by uh, first parties as well. So yeah, it's a it's an industry that relies a lot on synergies and symbiosis, and everyone learning from the other. And maybe that uh, if some enterprise has a good idea, like for example Xbox Game Pass, uh, maybe another enterprise may have to copy it to to make uh, to be closer to players. And in that case, there's always a benefit for players, which is in this case, for example, PlayStation bringing its yeah. its exclusive games to the, PC. The very the sole strong concern I would have is about the perception for players of games being free. Yeah. Uh, it's really cool and especially it allows players with different purchasing power 
so meaning players from different geography, players from Latin America, players from Africa, Southeast Asia, etc., mm -hmm. to get new games, which is great. But at the same time, um, one concern would be games are made by people who need to work, have a salary, uh, live, be able, etc. And so that has a cost. And having only three... Who is covering that cost? Exactly. And... and um, it's like you go to the super supermarket, you go to the movies, etc. You pay for something and you expect something in return. Mm -hmm. If you're used to not paying anymore, it means that when developers or publishers came to you without a subscription pass, uh, saying, okay, this game is great, uh, it's 30 euros, 40 euros, uh, 50 euros, etc., uh, players might be accustomed to not paying anymore. And who's going to. Um, uh, who's going to buy and games that are not on these yeah. subscription passes? Meaning that could create a creativity or originality um, struggle. May not be valued. Yeah. Yeah, basically. And uh, what do you think, because we've talked about uh, AAAs, about big industries, but what is your vision regarding devel the development of the indie gaming industry in the next, let's say, 10 years? It's already changing quite a lot. Um, first, because again, the way indie games were done previously, it was a lot of uh, unpaid work, uh, harsh conditions, etc. And since indie games got a lot of success and traction and visibility, which is really great, now it's uh, people are getting finally paid normally uh, with really good, better work condition, etc. But of course, it means that the budget range. Mm -hmm. uh, where are higher now. That's why it's very important that players keep in mind that games aren't free. Yeah. And especially because big companies will always find ways to have their games on game passes or subscription, etc. The one currently benefiting are indie games, which is cool, but the day any of the subscription passes stops, then the indie studios might be impacted by that. That's one of the risks. Second thing, it's still uh, innovation very often comes from, from indie wi with less financial risk. Yeah. Uh, they're not publicly traded companies, etc. So They might take a risk and if the game goes well, that's perfect. Yeah. And if the game does not go well, well, that yeah. was an experience. And but a, a lot of creativity and innovation still coming from yeah. indie game developers uh, yeah, yeah, every day. Exactly. And also that um, I think some years ago, let's say five, eight years ago, the indie gaming industry was uh, seen as those people who published games in mobile devices and that was it. And nowadays there's a lot of people developing really yeah. great uh, games and that are growing because they may have uh, a successful project yeah. and that they are growing at an, at an exponential rate. And uh, all that also brings in uh, competition because there's a lot of studios. Yeah. There's a lot of studios, uh, but still some are growing, so they might hire talent and grow even, and not be indie anymore. Hmm. Uh, some want to stay indie. The, the, um, yeah, it's still the, the, the like an incredible talent pool of creativity and innovation. And uh, to end uh, the interview, I want you to, to tell us what advice you would give to someone who wants to enter the video game industry as a developer, but who's afraid to it? Uh, the very first thing is play. Play video games. Uh, in a reasonable, it, yeah. reasonable way, of course, and not uh, keep having a life, because having a life is important, because it gives you thoughts, ideas, references, etc., on top of social life. And social life, it's networking, which is also important for entering the game industry. But playing games, uh, for benchmark, for having references, etc., is very important. Knowing what uh, Battle Brothers, uh, yeah. which is presented here, uh, there's great talk, is knowing what Factorio is, knowing what, uh, on top of The Last of Us or Red Dead Redemption, having like a panel uh, of cultural references and benchmark yeah. is, is a prerequisite to enter the industry, knowing what the industry is about and how rich and diverse it can be. Networking is really important, meaning attending events, even local events, like in your town, there's probably, or in your region, there's probably like a local event, local video game hubs, attending there. And uh, keep constantly being informed. 
uh, seeing YouTube videos, uh, checking uh, game dev talks on, on Twitch, uh, etc. And following people on Twitter and see uh, on Twitter or whatever so social uh, network and, um, uh, and see what they're saying, what they're sharing, etc. Yeah. Uh, being open while keeping your vision again, uh, networking and uh, building up your, your video game culture. Thanks a lot for being with us today, Yves. Thank you. And we hope to see you further. Thanks a lot. Bye.